In this video, we're going to talk about discrete time complex exponential sinusoidal signals uh, as part of the uh, signals and systems series of videos. So um, this is very similar to the continuous time uh, with some slight uh, differences that I'll try to point out as we go through this conversation. Let's go ahead and start with the signal definition. So x of n is x of n is the signal and we typically for the discrete one we like to write it as c a to the power of n okay so um so that's great that's that's the definition of it and it, depending on whether c is complex real or a is complex or real we get a whole bunch of different answers much like we did for the uh for the uh, continuous time let's go ahead and take a look at this discrete time as well let's say what would happen if c is real and a is real this is probably the most straightforward of all of them then your x of n which is c a to the power of n is going to be a real number times a real number to the power of n so now let's take a look at this thing and see kind of what happens depend on the value. So if A is larger than 1, every time N grows, it will grow. So it's an exponential growth. Okay, we've seen that before. And then if A is less than 1, um, let me get a different color. If A is less than 1, so we're looking at this one, you will see that as the power of N goes uh, less than minus 1, as the power of um goes up even powers are positive negative number to the power of even uh, positive and then on the odd n ends it will be a negative number so you get this profile both still expanding as you can see now as we uh, take a look at uh, a being between 0 and 1 or being uh, be between 0 and 1 or being between 0 and minus 1 you will see kind of the characteristic of it shrinking as the time goes by. Um, so this would be a you know negative exponential or an exponential decay on both of these, these both of this case and this case where in both this case a larger than one a less than one minus one was a um, exponential growth. So that's the simplest part where we have c was real when a was real now the question is what happens what happens if uh, if they're not real so let's let's take a look at that and kind of work through the process um, we're going to jump right into the more complex process where it says c is complex and we'll have the form which is c is equal to the magnitude of c e to j some angle and that's that basically says that c is complex if a is com and then again this is a polar form right and then what if a is also complex that's kind of the more the full everything in it and you've got now you've got basically your a um, if it's complex then it's going to be a is going to be equal to the magnitude of a e to the j omega zero and now so now we're going to go back and try to figure out what x of n is x of n was if you recall it was with the way we wrote it was c a to the power of n so if we do a little bit of work on this one we'll find out that's the magnitude of c e to the j theta plug in the complex numbers uh, polar form of the complex number in there and uh, a is going to be basically magnitude of a to the power of n and then e to the j, j omega 0 n so if we do a little bit more cleanup of this one we will have a c a to the power of n e to the power of j omega 0 n plus theta okay now Remember the Eulers, we can apply the Eulers identity to that, and we finally will be able to write x of n 
as basically C magnitude of A to the power of N cosine of omega zero N plus um, plus theta and that whole thing is plus J same thing C A to the N sine this time of omega zero N plus theta if we try to just to visualize this let's go ahead and try to take just the real portion this is the real portion let's just take the real portion and kind of try to understand what it looked like there's going to be a bunch of condition one of the simplest condition is going to be if a is equal to one this is just going to be a magnitude times the cosine so if a um, is equal to one that's one condition then we just got a sinusoidal signal running um, well, actually, uh, even the imaginary portion is going to be that. But if A is larger than 1, then the decay and growth comes into play. Because if this is larger or smaller than 1, or if it's not 1, basically, if it's not 1, then we're going to, if, if, if it's, uh, it's going to grow, it's going to add the exponential in here. So if we do that, if magnitude of A is larger than one then we're going to get this profile where it's going to start growing it's got the sign going but it's also growing over time if you get a between less than one of course it's a magnitude so it's always going to be positive in this case so if it's less than one then you're going to start seeing it shrink as n grows over time so hopefully you see the similarities between this and the continuous time they're pretty much the same the one exception the one exception uh, so if you want to think uh, this is a good thing for us to remember so one difference with uh, continuous time is the fact that in continuous time when we're working on continuous time every omega zero could be used to figure out a new period right for every omega zero there was and no, because for every omega zero there was a real number that worked there unfortunately for the discrete or fortunately we have to decide on that depending on the situation so discrete time you this this relationship is not true because omega zero must yield an n you, this has to be integer so what they have done is the relationship is almost the same as two omega, omega zero, but we introduce this other, we can call it whatever you want, we call it here an M. This is the, this M is the smallest, oops, smallest integer, smallest, that's a, erase it and rewrite it. I, wanna, I can't even write, read it. So if M is gotta be the smallest integer that makes N an integer. And really that's what we have to always watch, that N has to be an integer. So let, let's do it, let's do an example just to make sure we are all okay with one. So, Let's say in, someone comes to us and say, omega zero is given to us as five pi and given, this is given. So they're asking us to find N for a periodic dis discrete time signal, okay? So that's what they're looking at for us to do that. So what would you do? So if you just do it, we'll find out that N is, we say N is equal to this magical M times two pi over five pi. Pi's cancel out and I'll end up with two over five. The problem is two over five is not a whole number. So now the question is, what is the smallest number I can have here such that this whole thing comes out of the integer? Uh, such an energy becomes an integer. So the answer to that question is the smallest one I can think of is five. Therefore, n is actually two. And so that's 
these that's a that's a one exception uh, that when you're going from continuous time to discrete time you really need to pay attention and make sure you are all with it uh, otherwise uh, you, you can't say n is not an integer number that would just wouldn't be right so let me give you another um, situation where we got to pay special attention to the fact that n has to be an integer and this one is um, is an example someone comes to you and says given a discrete time signal so you somebody's giving you a signal and it's x of n and x of n is e to the j 4 pi over 8 times n plus e to the j 2 pi over 6 times n and the question given to you is what is what is the fundamental frequency of x of n and the fundamental frequency is the smallest frequency that uh, frequency that works for uh, for this uh, or the, uh, the, the, the the that would work here okay so so uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry it's not a fundamental frequency is fine but in this particular let's go ahead and do a fundamental period uh, which would uh, fundamental period would be the smallest period that it makes that signal periodic so now what we do with so the first thing is we need to look at this individual terms you have to first look at this term and if you look at that term we remember that these signals are e the general form is e to the j omega zero n so for the first for the first term omega zero is really four pi over eight great so that's fine. Can we find an n for this? Well, yeah, we know n is equal to m two pi over omega zero. If we do that, we got m omega zero is four pi eight. So I've got a four pi on the bottom, and we've got sixteen pi. Oops, did I get that right? Yeah, four pi on the bottom, sixteen pi on the top. We so m can stay one. We don't need m anymore because pi's cancel out, and that becomes a four. So the n for the first, so n1, the period for the first one, is first term is 4. What's the period for the second? Well, the second term, omega 0 is 2 pi over 6, which says n2, again, m times 2 pi divided by omega 0, which is going to be m times m times um, 2 pi over 2 pi and over 6 6 comes so about 2 pi is cancel out 6 comes up so this is kind of easy because in both of these cases we m could stay one they didn't have to increase the m together an integer we just got an integer okay so that's great now the fundamental frequency would be the lowest common multiplier of these two if there are 10 signal then you got to find a common the least common multiple of all of this so the, the simplest way was we say okay n one break them to its prime components and then make sure they don't have shared com shared primes so first one is two times two the bottom one is uh, three times two so you have to have two by two because you have to have both of those elements in your end result and you add a three to it so the n n period for x of n which is a combination of both of those signals will be 12. so that brings us to the end of kind of introducing discrete time complex exponential sinusoidal signals and also talking about 
the fact that you do need this extra m in here to ensure that n is an integer.